All right, our next speaker asked me to keep her introduction short, so um, I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, um, Marcetta York Darnsborg from Texas A&M University, a native of Kentucky who did her PhD work at, here at Illinois with her advisor, Ted Brown. Um, and she will be talking to us today about organometallic chemistry and sustainable energy. Uh, please welcome, join me in welcoming Marcetta. Oh, I have to speak into here. Thank you so much. I, it was a real honor to be invited to. Um, um, thank you. Oh, sorry. It's okay to participate in this, and it is also a daunting task because you know to speak in front of your research director, even when you're old, it's uh, <laughs> it's scary. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can find my. There we go. Okay, so um, Don and I, um, when we came to Illinois, Ted was still this young and beautiful guy. And in fact, he was so young that the story is that uh, he grew a beard so that the uh, secretaries wouldn't mistake him for a student. And he kept that beard over the years, and it's a real good trick that women can't do. Uh, you know, there's not a wrinkle that you can find. He still looks young. And uh, we're really delighted to be here to help him celebrate this birthday. And I changed the title of my talk. Um, I'm allowed to do that. <laughs> OK. I also don't know how this, um, this report came out just so timely for this, um, this symposium. But it's really great. And I can use it a bit in the talk that I want to have today in that this uh, statement jumped out at me. It's not clear how scientists can best give the world's government this message, or to what extent governments are up for hearing it. And to make them hear it, we have to have people who are very articulate and um, knowledgeable, and yet are um, educators. And so Ted is an educator and a researcher. Uh, I hope to have followed him a bit in that role, but I, I certainly could, do not have the leadership, the intellect, and the authorship abilities that Ted has. So I went to the internet, and of course, it got all these books, and I only have a few of them here, many of them his freshman chemistry text, um, but also this bridging divides text. You know, this is a story of how the Beckman was developed. It really highlights leadership abilities and the, the ability of Ted to bring people together. And I think it should be required reading for all university administrators who want to build something and, and have consensus. And then I hope that you have read um, or have seen The Beauty of Their Dreams, this novel that Ted wrote. It's so much fun to read. And in fact, uh, I love the characters, and I've read it twice. Uh, and then this book over here, Ted has always had an interest in metaphors and science. And I figure I could use that as my um, connection to the topic today. And the metaphor I use is Janus, the um, Roman god of beginnings and of portals and transitions. And he looks back, and you've seen something like this before. Uh, possibly, Hadean Earth, four and a half billion years ago, the Earth was in a very harsh environment. The um, CO2 levels in the universe at this particular time is estimated to be uh, huge, uh, and, but there's not only CO2, there's hydrogen sulfide, methane, carbon monoxide, lots of small molecules. So it's a harsh environment. But life possibly began there. Really rudimentary life forms needing catalysts to process hydrogen that may have um, evolved into the uh, hydrogenase active sites that I'll be speaking about later. Janus looks backwards, and he also looks forward to this beautiful Earth that evolution eventually brought us to. 
this blue and green earth that has, um, can support life, including one life form that is supposed to be superior and capable of protecting the earth and its environment um, for much longer than it's happening now. So how can that, how can that superior being do, do this? Perhaps Janice can look forward to the better use of the solar, um, of the sun, uh, creating solar electrons and using that for the things that humans think we need to have. So that's my, where I come in, um, or I can start to come in. Uh, the renewable energy systems that we could get, use, including solar, wind, geothermal, etc. Well, particularly the solar and the wind, these energies are available to us intermittently and we need a way to store them. We can store that energy in chemical bonds through electrolyzers. We might be able to, well, we definitely can create hydrogen and maybe other um, carb uh, uh, storage capacity for electrons, carbon-hydrogen bonds, nitrogen-hydrogen bonds. But hydrogen is the one that gets a lot of attention. So electrolyzers can form the hydrogen, fuel cells can use the hydrogen, and we can use that uh, as a liquid fuel source. Notice in these uh, um, electrochemical cells, there is always, there's a need for surfaces where electrons and protons can be uh, connected. And these surfaces, right, these electrodes, currently the best one is platinum. And you might, platinum is um, expensive, it's resource limited, and um, you might ask, well, why not use cheap metals? All metals can transport electrons, and, um, but the cheap metals don't work so well. Why does platinum work the best? Well, this, uh, let's just consider what goes on at the surface of an electrode. This is a very simple, <laughs> it's not a movie. Uh, animation. So protons connect with electrons and generate hydrogen atoms absorbed on the surface. They migrate to find each other and form dihydrogen and release dihydrogen. So these hydrogen atoms must be firmly enough bound so that they can have time to migrate, um, but the hydrogen molecule must not be so firmly bound that it won't be desorbed. So we see these volcano plots that addresses this question of why platinum. So this is a plot, a simple plot of metal hydrogen bond strengths, which shows that these metals over here have um, bond strengths that are too high. The metals over here have bond strengths that are too weak. And right here in the middle is the sweet spot. This is platinum and another metaf metaphor, the Goldilocks effect. So this is just right, and these are all noble metals, expensive metals. But nature does this reaction too, and uh, of hydrogen processing. And this is the, a graphic of a plant, a very a simple plant, uh, and um, its root system generating organic substrates perhaps, and down here in the bottom of this uh, uh, pond are, um, is a reaction that converts CO2 to methane. Uh, as we go up in potential, we eventually get to the top, and this is the null gas bacteria that, uh, that will use oxygen as the terminal electron uh, acceptor from dihydrogen. So in all of these processes, uh, uh, it, it, that may go on in a, in a silt of a river or, or pond. All of these processes require uh, hydrogen. So there's lots of hydrogenases that, um, that are used here. So the discovery of the hydrogenases was by Marjorie Jane Stevenson uh, in 1930. 
and her work was to go into this river mud in Cambridge and figure out what was uh, causing these gases to rise to the surface and the gases were burning, the gas was methane. And she did, and this was the story as shown here. I'll show it again later. But what she found that was that glucose was being fermented, but not to alcohol, but rather to methane. And she, she surmised and suggested that this process here was reversible and it was the most negative reversible redox as yet described in living cells. It occurred at a pH of seven and hydrogen, very low hydrogen pressure and potential of negative 0.4 volts. This is a timeline that my student Pokeraj put together, um, giving me a lot of credit here before Tom Routfuss. Uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, but he, he's a very nice guy. Uh, um, that shows what's happened in this field. This is a community of scientists that study these um, hydrogenases. And um, beginning in the 1930s, every decade since has seen major um, contributions. And then the last decade and a half has really escalated in this area. So at first it was just the microbiologists figuring out what, what genes were uh, needed what, um, to, to make the hydrogenases. Then some chemistry got into the story. In the 1980s, there, it, there was a discovery that nickel was in some hydrogenases. And because of that, EPR spectroscopy could be used to track redox levels. Then in 94, it was discovered that diatomic ligands, cyanide and carbon monoxide, were in the active sites of uh, active side nickel iron hydrogenase. And at this point, this would la allowed Don Derensburg to shine because he knew all of this stuff from Ted's group on CO stretching frequencies and intensities and isotopic uh, uh, shifts, uh, shifts in um, CO stretching frequencies from isotopic labeling. And so we were able to get into the story here, just as organometallic chemists, simple organometallic chemists that we are, uh, we had something to say about these uh, structures found in nature. Chemists really got involved when these crystal structures of the uh, enzymes started to appear, and uh, I'll show you those. I say chemists got involved because that's when my synthetic skills which were qu quickly overwhelmed by Tom Routfuss's synthetic skills. Tom is a, a professor here, of course, and Chris Pickett, a friend in England. So the three of us published in this area at the beginning, almost simultaneously, on one discovery. And so we started working on model complexes. Uh, and finally, I'll show you what some of the more recent things have become. Finally, there were hybrid enzymes, but that's what I'll talk about. I want to digress just a minute here. You mentioned that it's really important that women uh, be included in, uh, well, be educated around the world. Women have always been really front and center in the hydrogenase field, particularly the microbiologist. This is Marjorie Stevenson, the um, discoverer of hydrogenases. Uh, Paulette Vignier, uh, who um, also a microbiologist who did a lot of key reviews and compilations of data, showed that hydrogenases were all over in biology. And Barbara Friedrich, uh, who, who directed the research of many people towards biotech, using these things as for biofuel cells. So this area has been stimulated. I'll just mention to Ted that another novel that you might write is, involves the, that you might build it off of the shoulders of this giantess. Uh, there is one um, uh, biography called Holding Hands with Bacteria. She had an amazing life interrupted by 
World War I, which she served, and also um, all of her research, she never got away from it. The Stevenson Prize for Microbiology was established in the 1950s, and a winner of that prize uh, is a man I think that is familiar to many people here at Illinois, uh, in the chemistry department at any rate. He's a, uh, also a microbiologist, and he gave me this slide, which he's been trying to educate me for a long time, uh, as to what was really going on in the biochemistry. So this is the organic matter in this polluted river. And bacteria and protozoa take, need to convert it into CO2, hydrogen. This is the fermentation process that doesn't make alcohol. And the diiron hydrogenases are there to produce hydrogen, take excess electrons, and turn them into hydrogen. And in the, net, the following step, hydrogen and CO2 are, con, are combined to make methane. This step requires activation of hydrogen, extraction of those electrons, and that requires the nickel iron hydrogenase. There's a poor cousin to these hydrogenases. It's a mono iron, but uh, it's only expressed when there's not enough nickel. The structures, as I said, are known. I'll show them again on the next slide. I just want to mention that the hydrogen is processed by these cheap metals um, in, in a heterolytic fashion. Hydrogen becomes hydride and a proton, and that has been shown by isotopic exchange experiments. So here is the, the crystal structures of the nickel iron and the diiron hydrogenase. Um, both of these show interesting little pieces of pyrite, iron sulfur clusters that march from the outside of the protein into the inside where this active site is. The same over here with the nickel iron hydrogenase. These molecular catalysts are shown to be bimetallic and this one has a, one of the four iron, four sulfur cluster, this bit of uh, mineral attached directly through a cysteine to the di-iron system. The nickel iron hydrogenase is also binuclear. Both, in both kinds, the iron has cyanide and carbon monoxide ligands, hearkening back, I think, to primordial uh, origins. The, in nickel, the nickel iron hydrogenase comes in two forms. There's a nickel iron selenium hydrogenase, uh, and uh, it's just a subclass. It's more oxygen stable, in, uh, in, in fact, than is the uh, plain nickel iron sulfur. And then here is the straightforward, or, well, the simple organometallic that is in this mono iron hydrogenase. The important part is nature doesn't have platinum uh, to, uh, to be involved in uh, living forms, so she makes up for it by using two metals and sulfur in a very intricate arrangement, simple enough for us to get an idea of what might be going on. So this idea is shown here. Um, in the di-iron hydrogenase, we, we, we see this cofactor, a thiolate with a nitrogen at the top. This is a nitrogen base that is pointed towards an iron uh, where there's an open site on the iron. It's pretty clear that that iron can accept a proton and reduce that proton to a hydride. This nitrogen accept, base can accept a proton, leave it as a proton, and these things couple in a hydride proton coupling. In the nickel iron hydrogenase, something similar happens, except this base is not a nitrogen base, it's a much poorer base, it's a sulfur. Uh, and there's a structure of that, so this tells us how far we've come in terms of structures of proteins. It's really high resolution that shows the hydrogens uh, in the positions that I mentioned up here. There's also an interesting selenium, selenium, uh, nickel iron selenium structure that puts that selenium at the same place where that hydrogen is. Okay. There is a fourth hydrogenase. Nitrogenase, which is a, a, a huge energy drain, 
um, taken about 2%, I think, of the energy requirement. In order to reduce nitrogen to ammonia, there's a requirement of eight protons and eight electrons. And there is two ammonias uh, produced for every nitrogen molecule and one dihydrogen, one hydrogen molecule. So the question is, is this hydrogen just a throwaway? Why did nature do this? And this has been worked on uh, by uh, Brian Hoffman quite a bit. And he concludes, he and his colleagues conclude that this is because that this hydrogen is obligatory, it must happen, otherwise the nitrogen won't bind. So I want to just show you this. This is um, the nitrogenase active site. It's very complex. It has, it's, it's a real piece of iron sulfur mineral but it still behaves like a giant molecule. And hydrogen can bind into those sites between two irons or somewhere. Protons can go on the sulfurs, but it's a huge problem to figure this one out. So Brian Hoffman has pretty much spent his, um, the last 40 years of his career uh, thinking about this. Okay, so the, the story is that protons and electrons are always added one by one. Uh, first one electron, one proton, sequentially, until one reaches a state up here where this E4 state eliminates any point along this route here. If it reverses, hydrogen will be eliminated. Two protons, two electrons make hydrogen. If it goes up here, hydrogen can be eliminated. However, in the presence of nitrogen, Nitrogen binds to this state where there's been four, hydrogen, four protons and four electrons added. Nitrogen binds, eliminates hydrogen, and then from then on, we can go on to form uh, ammonia. So this is another thing that, uh, huh, I lost something here. There it is. This is a, another Janus effect, which, um, Brian uses this metaphor all the time to say E4 looks backwards and it looks forward. And what happens here when hydrogen is eliminated, this up to E4, it's, this thing is taken up four electrons. When hydrogen is eliminated by this reductive elimination, just elimination of two hydrogen atoms, it leaves two of those electrons on this cluster and the cluster is all set up for, high, for um, nitrogen binding and nitrogen, um, sorry, nitrogen binding and nitrogen reduction following that. Okay, so what do we want in a molecular catalyst? I I'll just show this uh, graphic again, except uh, let's assume that the catalyst is a molecular species that has to accept uh, protons and electrons from an electrode surface. So hydrogen can be eliminated at two redox levels, either two electrons or a third electron can be added and can, this can lead back into the catalytic cycle. Well, molecular catalysts that we can make are not embedded in a protein. Molecular catalysts that we can study if we try to do this type of reaction, there's many things that can go on out here. It's not a robust system. So the question is, how can we make it more robust or what even could those catalysts look like? Well, the catalyst might look like this diiron hydrogenase active site. We might try to model this uh, to make small molecule models and expect that they might follow this mechanism that has been worked out by computations. So beginning up here with the resting state of the enzyme, it's attached to this 4-iron-4-sulfur four four cluster in the plus 2 form, iron in the plus 1 oxidation state, cyan uh, uh, iron in the plus 2 oxidation state, picks up a proton and an electron, picks up another electron, that 4-iron-4-sulfur four four cluster participates in the, the business here. 
The electrons are going into the iron centers or into this cluster and protons are being added as I suggested before. And eventually we get to the point where a proton and a hydride are adjacent to each other and elimination of dihydrogen through this route can occur. This was worked out by my colleague Mike Hall uh, just on, uh, initially on seeing the structure. This is a computational story. So the features then that we see there is that this is a redox shuttle, electron shuttle. It stores electrons. This is a base uh, at, arranged by nature to be very close to this iron, which has an open site that could pick up a, a, a hydrogen, a proton. The irons are close together so that a conduit for electron flow through here is pretty easy. There's a bridging carbon monoxide that helps maintain this framework. And as I said before, carbon monoxide and cyanide are needed to maintain the iron in a low spin, low valent form. So this structure uh, is, seems pretty complex at first sight and yet pretty simple. Because we know from the organometallic literature that this little iron hexacarbonyl uh, diphthylate has been known for decades and decades. And so people like Tom and myself and Chris latched onto this molecule. We squeezed it for every piece of information that it might have, uh, looking at ligand substitution reactions, modifying it so we can make it possibly closer to this. So this was a model of the active side. And yeah, and, and we had success, we had some success, but we didn't make a really good catalyst until people started to really understand the role of the protein and, um, and other things. So let me show you one huge success. So we could turn these carbon monoxides into cyanides by just simple substitution reactions. And then it was found over that this big group over in Europe finally took these synthetic models that Tom and I could make and they added those models to empty proteins, proteins that had not been matured in the, in the cell or, or in the environment that the hydrogenase should be produced. Empty proteins. And they found that they made this synthetic guy that was made on the bench tap, top actually became a working, uh, fully functional uh, uh, protein. So this, is, this may remind you of what Francis Arnold was doing by adding synthetic um, uh, molecules into proteins, but this, this has no genetic modification at the beginning here. It was just an empty site. So when you shove this into the protein, it does something, it loses carbon monoxide, it goes into this rotated form, and then it becomes fully active. So this opens a lot of doors, and the questions in research. And, I, and Tom Rautfuss has a wonderful collaboration with parts of this group. This group sort of fell apart, they started arguing with each other uh, as whose name should go first and whose name should go last and blah, blah, blah. So there's, I don't know which part that Tom is collaborating with, but there's much to do in this area. So uh, uh, Tom's a formidable synthetic chemist, one of the best I've ever seen in inorganic chemistry. And I decided I couldn't compete with in that area without that collaboration. So I went to the lab and started thinking about other things. I could make some model compounds that take advantage of some of my um, long-term interests when in, in, in these type of ligands here. These ligands are two nitrogens, two sulfurs that engulf a metal, uh, nickel and iron and cobalt as shown here. And we can modify them slightly, but the cool thing about these ligands is after they attach themselves to the metal, the sulfurs that are out here still have activity. 
they still have lone pairs, and those lone pairs can attach another metal. So you can use these as templates for building multi-metallic sites. And that's what we did. So uh, a postdoc made this molecule here. So iron with this N2S2 ligand with a terminal nitrosyl, nitri uh, nitric oxide ligand, and iron dinitrosyl over here. So it's a two iron um, uh, system. There's redox activity all over the place. This iron nitrosyl can be reduced, and this iron dinitrosyl also can be reduced, so it can take up an electron here, an electron here. And Mark suggested that we try this molecule as a surrogate for the di-iron system that looks a lot more like this enzyme active site. Furthermore, this is a very stable molecule uh, the, in the cationic form, as shown here. Every time he tried a different reaction, he got the same thing. So. Uh, Looking at it a little bit further, we see it has very nice electrochemical uh, properties. Um, it shows two clearly reversible redox wave, and we want to have good um, electrochemistry for these things. So uh, the first question was, can we isolate these reduced forms? And what, we, what Mark found was that you definitely could. Um, Addition of an electron to this cation made a neutral species, and the most important point is that it hangs together, just as the electrochemistry said it would. We can monitor these reactions by infrared spectroscopy, and we can also isolate the products, look at their EPR properties, their crystal structures, and we see how this system over here, the iron nitrosyl, responds to an electron being added over here. And um, we see that this has a, a single unpaired electron in the system. That's seen by EPR, and so there's lots of handles that we as chemists can use to explore this. To get the third redox level, to, we, ha we start with this one, we made this one, and we want to go over here. We had to use a more flexible ligand, and, and um, this gives us a very, uh, very electron-rich system, and the, there's interesting properties to this molecule as well, which I don't want to uh, bore you with too much. But we go from an almost linear, well, not, uh, it's slightly bent iron NO to a more bent iron NO, and we were expecting an even more bent iron NO, but it straightened back out. And so we can understand this if we go into detail on how, what is going on with the electronic arrangement in these molecules. So not only do, does the nitrosyl accept electrons, but this iron can shift up in and out of this plane, and that helps delocalize the electron density. We find that we go from a diamagnetic uh, complex to a paramagnetic complex, to one with a triplet state, and uh, two unpaired electrons. So we have a nice system here, but I have to go back to what E. Lu talks about all the time. And he says, you have a, a model of the bird, and it took people centuries to develop these models of birds, but they didn't fly. And it wasn't until they really understood the aerodynamics of a bird flight that they were able to get uh, an airplane. So the question is, does our bird fly? And my question is, if so, how far will it fly? Because robustness is a real issue. So this can this strange bird, it might look like an ostrich uh, compared to uh, the eagle, that is the um, enzyme active site, does it fly? Well, I got a lot of pushback about ex exploring these, spending money to study these compounds, because people were afraid of nitric oxide. I mean, you're all familiar with nitric oxide. It's, uh, there's so many things that, that it can do. Its chemistry is extremely rich. It's biochemistry, it's physiological chemistry. 
is extremely rich. So these are questions that were asked, uh, you know, it just floats away, it will react and do this, it says it's guilty, that means it's not, it, it, it uh, accepts electrons, gets mixed up with the metal, and that's exactly what it does, and that's what we were showing, and that's what we wanted to do. And so what we decided we would do is to not to fear, but we'll be very careful. Okay, so let me go through a little bit of, of what I've actually been doing, and I, I just want to say that I've actually been training students uh, and, and pursuing a problem and analyzing uh, it in a scientific way. So here we go. We, as I said before, we have these two nicely reversible uh, electrochemical events, and if we look at bulk electrolysis or scan this electrochemical event in the presence of protons, it should give us an idea of what will happen when we go to here, uh, when we put the electron in that system. And indeed, we see a catalytic response, a, re a, a response to added protons at this potential, we have to use a rather strong acid, and we see hydrogen being uh, uh, produced. We analyzed for that. For the second, a second event, we, have to use, we can use a weak acid, we have to use a weak acid in order to see it. And so here we had to be careful, because we saw this catalytic response, but there was no hydrogen. So it says something else is going on at that electrode that is just decomposing perhaps the uh, compound, and we expect that this is being produced when we're at this redox level. So what to do then? We were, Mark was pretty disappointed, but we decided we'd do what chemists do. Chemists, and, or what I can do, is I can design um, experiments, I can design new molecules that may inform on what's going on. So, we have a toolbox, our synthetic toolbox takes iron dinitrosyl that I showed you, a precursor for that, an organometallic psychopentadienyl iron, and also our M and 2S2. These are the metalloligands, these are the iron acceptors. And this is the one that we had made before that I talked about, and instead of using the iron dithiolate, we can use the nickel dithiolate, bless you. Uh, and then we can, over on this side, we can make this psychopentadienyl iron carbonyl compound uh, with either the iron nitrosyl or the nickel. The differences in these systems is that we call these based on hard and soft electron donors. And the hard and soft refers to redox activity. So this one is soft on both sides. It's easy to put in an electron in both of these, or it can be delocalized. This one's soft over here, hard over here, hard here, soft here, and this, the final one, is, has no nitrosyls, and it's the hard, hard version. All of these show some ability to produce dihydrogen. But if you look carefully at the electrochemical traces, you would see that they all display unique electrochemical traces and unique mechanistic features. So, what to do next? Well, we ask again our uh, computational buddy, uh, Mike Hall, with a joint student who's, I think, uh, one of the smartest people I've ever met. He knows it. <laughs> At least, <laughs> he's not, he doesn't, Disagree with me ever? No. <laughs> but I, I won't, of course, I'm not going to go through this, but all I want to say is I want to point out this line. They do an exhaustive search for the lowest energy structures. So not only was Xing Da smart, he was also really hard working. Um, so he, I'll give you a, 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 something here. This is the basis of doing those mechanistic computations. We start with assumptions that the catalyst must have a Lewis acid and a Lewis base and vac vacant sites to accommodate 
electrons, protons, and, 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 and protons. And we follow the just organometallic chemistry uh, uh, assumptions and uh, knowledge. We talk about hemilability of these thylates that might create an open site on iron and an open site on the sulfur. And we also uh, suggest, assume that protons and electrons will arrive separately. While the complex remains overall intact, one of these bonds might be broken, but it hangs together. Now we know that's not going to happen always. We know there's uh, decomposition, but this is where we start the starting point that we begin with. And we will correlate events in electrocatalysis with uh, the potential and the pKa. So if we look at this system, we're saying we have hot sites where electrons might be stored, either the iron nitrosyl or the iron, the nickel or the iron. So we will look for structures that will have an extra electron. We look for, in both of these, as they are, there's only one spot that you could protonate, and you could protonate the, the nickel. We look for chemical reactivity. Will there be metal sulfur bond cleavage? And if there is bond cleavage, that opens up new sites for uh, proton and uh, protons to be deposited. So this is uh, definitely com being compared to the nickel iron hydrogenase, and so we look for hydride proton coupling. So this is a mess. I don't want to uh, to go through it much, but I just I will say a couple of things. We look at the first electrochemical wave here, and we see that we have to add quite a bit of acid to it before we see something happening over here. And after 12 equivalents of, uh, 6 to 12 equivalents of acid, we see a new peak growing in, and we think that peak refers to this protonated form. And then after that, you can add, it's all downhill pretty much, you add another electron, uh, you add another proton, you get a proton on the, going to the iron, making a hydride, proton on the sulfur, making the proton hydride coupling possible and the elimination of dihydrogen. So that is that system. Uh, I asked Shigna to give me some structures. I wanted to know about this idea of a third electron. So this is what we saw on that last slide. If this form here, to which two electrons and two protons have been added, find this molecular, molecular species to have an iron hydride and a sulfur proton close to each other, 2.6 is the calculated distance. And the barrier to that coupling is around 12 kcals per mole. If one adds another electron, elect uh, computationally, there's a subtle shift in the structure that rotates this sulfur proton so that it's closer to that hydride. And that makes the proton hydride distance 1.5 angstroms. That lowers that activation barrier to 3.6. So that tells us, that gives us insight into a lot of things that goes on. And this one is a real mess, so let me just say that the bottom line here is that we, we find that these protons sort of migrate around for the iron nitrosyl and the iron dinitrosyl. And the overall story is reductive elimination, just like it is in the nitrogenase. So having these redox active ligands that can store electrons on them generates a new mechanism for the hydrogen elimination. OK. So come on. So the take home message from this is that the, each of these molecular catalysts sort of have different precursors, immediate precursors to hydrogen elimination. And you know, we're all excited about this and we look at it, uh, analyze it uh, over and over and think about how could we make these things more robust and last longer. 
If you get practical with us, I will just tell you that this hard, hard interaction that we made is the most robust. The soft, soft interaction is the easiest to make hydrogen, but it's the least robust. And the two in the middle are sort of in the sweet spot, but these numbers are still pretty poor uh, compared to the enzyme, extremely poor. So uh, there's, there's work to be done here. Whether these should be the ones that are pursued or not, I don't know, but they've been very informative. And as I said, they've trained a lot of students. So I want to say that for the past 30 years in, at Texas A&M, we have, uh, Dodd's group and my group have gone out to the Yankees Tavern and had a picture made. It's really good for the international students because they think this is, you know, real Texas. And, and you wouldn't believe this bike, it's beautiful. So, um, and you can see this is Shingda and, um, and Ghosh. They didn't really like to stand next to each other, but the synthetic chemist, the computational chemist, and a really sweet Rachel, and me in the middle. And so I see that with me and my metal around my neck and everything, and I, I go back to something else. I go back to uh, what we were talking about. No, I'll get back to, to me in just a second. This, this quote was also taken out of that report. When I see students like that, to my knowledge, there's not a bad apple in the group. And I think we have to mobilize those students more. You know, they're really excited about having safety checks in the lab. We need to have more uh, uh, things that relate to uh, sustainability uh, checks in the lab. Uh, and then I, I wanted to say, I was taken out of the hills of Kentucky, kicking and screaming because it had a strong tug on my heart. And I eventually became me. My first stop along my path was here at Illinois. And with the, mo the best and the kindest and the most encouraging people in the world, both Ted and Audrey. So thank you, Ted. Happy birthday. Best to Audrey. Thank you so much. We have time for a few questions before the break. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Marcel, I just wanted to ask you to amplify a little bit on the, uh, the older reduction in SSR that was done by Dr. Kelly and 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 Dr
um, to bulk them up so that they can do this reaction more efficiently. Yeah. Okay. Ted? So, Marcel, what's the holy grail here? What, 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 do, you, what do you see down the line? Is it going to be a big pot someplace in which you put this stuff and you can generate hydrogen out the other end? No, it should be, these catalysts should be immobilized just like platinum is immobilized. Or platinum is a solid. Uh, they should be immobilized on a carbon surface, a cheap surface. And they, um, that in itself would make them more robust. Mm -hmm. And the modifications that have been made by maybe 3,000 uh, structures now are out there. But the modifications made recently by Dennis Lichtenberger, uh, for one, have really improved the efficiency. And I think you have to get them mobilized and protected from oxygen from in, in order to be robust. So it's the bro robustness that we have to seek, but I think they could be possibly even better than platinum. I don't know. Maybe not better, but at least cheaper. All right, but Great. Thank you so much. And uh, we will now be taking a break and we'll be we'll reconvene at 1030.